So can we can we talk about myth and religion a little bit? Yes. So, I mean, can we start at the beginning, which is like myths, how are they born? There's this collective intelligence amongst us human beings, and we seem to create these beautiful ideas that captivate the minds of millions. How is such a myth born? Great question. Okay, so that brings us to terminology again in... Um, in my field, we we definitely, I think, try not to distinguish between religion. I, this is going to be controversial, I uh -oh. think, between religion and myth, because we call other cultures, religions, myths, right? And then we call our myths religions. And I guess myth has a bad connotation to it, that it's, it's not, not somehow true. real. Yeah. Right? Now, what's interesting is that um, people like Plato, who lived thousands of years ago, 2,500 about, um, basically made this distinction himself within his own culture, which was Greek, right? So Plato is a very famous Greek philosopher. And he would say things like this. He would say that um, he would make a distinction between the reality of the one God or the one. He would call it, he didn't call use the word God, but he's referencing a divinity of Okay. And he believes in the soul. Okay. So, but he would also say that the gods and goddesses of the Greeks are just myths. Mm -hmm. So even he would make that distinction again. You know, he would say the population is not too bright. So they believe in these gods and goddesses. But he himself is talking to his students and he's basically talking about forms. You know, so, you know, they're, that live in, seem to live in these other dimensions. Like this table, let's go back to this table that we're talking um, around right now. He would say that th this table is the instantiation of the form table and that there's this table that actually exists somewhere. It's where this place where numbers exist, like yeah. the number two. Okay, so there we use the number two mathematically, therefore it exists. But have you ever seen a real one? Have you ever seen the real two? No. No. Okay. So, but where does it exist? So he says that tables, so he was also talking about things that, you know, he says are real, making a distinction between the people. And, and by the way, he got this from Socrates, his, his um, mentor, who was killed by Athens because he would say such things. People don't like to be told that they, what they believe in is not real, right? Yeah. By the way, his idea of forms is just, you just make me realize how like incredible was that somebody like that was able to come up with that. I mean, that idea became a myth, That uh, the idea of forms, right? That permeated uh, probably the most influential set of ideas in, in, in the history of philosophy, in the history of ideas. Yes, yeah, it's, I mean, Plato, we know him for a reason, right? Yeah, so let's say that we're not, uh, it's a gray area between religious and myths and maybe not even- It is gray, yeah. yeah. Uh, so what? How's that idea with like little Plato start and permeate through okay. all of society? Oh, oh, how does that happen? Okay, so there are different ways that religions work. Um, so a lot of people would call the UFO narrative today like a, uh, and this is what I talk about in my book, like a myth, right? The UFO myth. But a lot of people believe in it. Okay, so how do these things work? Well, what I did was I took, um, there's a, Ann Taves at, um. UC Santa Barbara, she's a pretty well-known academic who studies religion, and she has this building block definition of religion, like it builds, okay? Mm -hmm. And so she says there are, there, are, there are no religious experiences or mythic experiences. There are experiences, and then they get interpreted as religious or mythic, okay? And so I, I use that with the UFO narrative. So I take um, and I compare it to the religious narrative. So basically what happens, um, what happens is this, is that a person generally has a very ex uh, intense experience. Um, it could be with something that they see in the sky, a being, you know, that they see, um, you know, like Moses in the burning bush or something like that. They tell other people, okay? And those other people believe them because they say, that guy, let's take you. Okay, Lex. Okay, so you're playing, you know, some of your music, Jimi Hendrix yeah. shows up out of the blue. So Jimi Hendrix, who's, who does electric church stuff, right? The electric church movement. So he shows up. I was, uh, sorry for a small tangent. I was, I'm not aware of, I apologize if I should be. I just know how to play all of the songs. Uh, electric church. 
Is this a oh, thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, this it's Jimi Hendrix's thing. Yeah. So, that, that was like a philosophy of his or what? Yes, what is, yes, yes. So he oh, thought wow. he was, it was like a mission for him. Like, a, like he was a missionary and he was like doing the electric church. It was through his mission of music that he was actually impacting people spiritually. And I, I think you have to agree that his oh, music that is, is really spiritual. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool to know that there's like a philosophy there. Yeah. I wonder if he's ever written anything. He's spoken uh, about it many times. Interesting. Yeah. Me too. I actually do some some research here. Wow. That adds another level of depth. That's awesome. Okay. So. Okay. So say Lex is playing. Yeah. Hendrix. One of his so songs. Yeah. He shows up. What's your favorite Hendrix song, by the way? Oh, that's a hard one. I like Castles in the Sand. It's a sad one, but yeah. I, I like it. <laughs> so I'm playing something. And yes. I show up. And all of a sudden, boom, just like Elvis does for people. Yeah. Hendrix shows up. All right. And then you're amazed and then he tells you something that's very very significant and he says you need to tell other people this okay <laughs> so then like okay i go on social media <laughs> <laughs> yes and you start and because people believe you and yeah. because you are a person of um you know credibility yeah. people believe you and so all of a sudden a movement starts okay and it's the hendrix movement it's hendrix 2 or something like yeah. that you know we call it something uh, the next iteration of Hendrix, yeah. right? Hendrix lives, but he lives as this vibration, and only Lex can, like, you know, can can manifest <laughs> this vibration. Okay, so like this is this is how religions start. Ex yeah. You know, excuse your audience who are religious. I'm actually a practicing Catholic, so um, this is how religions start. They start with first off a contact experience. Uh, not, I mean, not all of them, but a good portion of them. Um, Peep, some person has an experience that's transcendent, sacred to them, and they go and they tell other people, and then those people tell other people, and then something gets written about it, okay? And then it becomes, because it's a charismatic movement, people become affected by it, and if, if too many people are affected by it, um, an institution steps in and tries to control the narrative. Uh, so this is what you'd call the beginning of a religion or a myth, a very powerful myth. And so it's almost like a star, right? A star is born. A star okay. Is born. Yeah. When you say institution, do you mean some other organization that's already powerful? Doesn't yes. want to become mm -hmm. uh, overpowered by this new movement? Yes, absolutely. Is so this you, usually yeah. governments? It's or? usually, yeah. So uh, I have a couple of examples. I use the example of the Christian church in my book because I'm most familiar with the history of Christianity. And, you know, Christianity. You know, it was started by this Jewish man, and it was a movement that, you know, he was a very powerful, charismatic person. Other people believed in him, and then his followers talked about him. And then other, then, you know, usually early Christians before the 300s were generally people who were disenfranchised because he had a pretty radical idea that, you know, humans should have dignity. And this was pretty radical during that time. So women who didn't have dignity and, you know, slaves who didn't have dignity at the time um, converged to Christianity in droves. And so what happened was that all of a sudden um, it became this belief system that was undercurrent. And then uh, Constantine, um, who was an elite, uh, had an experience and made Christianity a state religion. Um, by that time, there were different forms of Christianity, probably hundreds of them, well, most likely. And Constantine and the people who were powerful with him decided that their idea, this is the Council of Nicaea now, decided that there was one form, and they called it universal, the one form of Christianity, and this should be it. And so they they kind of took out all the other denominations of Christianity and different forms of it. So you can see that a very, very powerful set of beliefs put a culture on fire, right? Mm. And so how did they, they had to deal with that fire somehow. And so they narrativized it. They decided, how do we interpret this? And they interpreted it as they wished, but that wasn't the only interpretation of Christianity. I have another example. Um, in the Catholic Church, um, a lot of times, and I'm going to use the uh, example of uh, Faustina. Um, she's um, she's a nun, and she's Polish. And um, I think it was in the early 20th century, if not the 1800s, that she had a very powerful uh, 
many experiences actually of of Jesus, and she saw Jesus with rays coming out of his his heart, and basically she called this his divine mercy, and it became a devotion in Poland, and it spread. Hmm. The Catholic Church was not not into this at all. Okay, <laughs> and so they did everything they could to try to suppress Faustina's influence which was growing and growing and growing and growing, okay? And so they were very successful in trying to keep her quiet, and she died, okay? Years later, John Paul II, Polish, sainted her and created the Divine Mercy Devotion, which is worldwide now, and millions and millions of people. But you, do you see how they, yeah. they you know, completely control it? so here? fascinating that it... Uh... That it just starts with a single, so like you said, contact experience. Yes. Experience is the key word. And do, is your sense that those experiences are legitimate? So it's not yes. uh, somehow for the most artificially part, constructed? Yeah. I think for the most part, there are legitimate experiences that people have. Why would someone want to put themselves through what they go through? Like, why would Jesus want to get crucified? I mean, that's a pretty nasty way to die. Um, you know, why would Faustina bring this upon herself? Um the people that I meet who have said that they've seen UFOs, that most of them don't want to be known because of the ridicule that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. So I honestly think that, you know, there are people who are maybe not stable and would like the attention, but for the most part, normal people don't want this attention. So you mentioned building blocks. Uh, you didn't mention the word God um, or sort of the afterlife. Are those essential to the myth, so there's a contact experience. Is there some other aspects of myth and religion which makes them viral, <laughs> which makes them spread and captivate the imagination uh, of uh, people? Yes, is there a pattern to them? I think that for each era, it's different. And people have, first let's talk about the definition of religion, if that's yes. okay, because yes. most people assume the definitions that we in the West are familiar with, which is that, you know, that of Christianity, Islam, um, Judaism, you know, monotheistic religions. And there are, that's not, I mean, those are just some religions. There are so many different types of religions. Some religions have no God at all. Uh, Zen Buddhism, for example, is a religion that asks you to take away your belief structures, like to kind of like, in fact, I would call that a Kantian type religion, right? And yeah. that it's, it's basically telling you to get rid of your concept, concepts of what you think about things so that you can actually have the experience, like you were talking about earlier, of the thing in itself. And they call that Satori. So there are people who believe, you know, they try to, they call it meditation, Zen meditation, um, and it's fairly radical, actually. Um, in some monasteries, I don't know if they still do this, but they'll whack you on the head if you appear to be um, not focusing and, you know, that kind of thing. You know, they do things to, to basically take you f away from your conceptions of reality and bring you into a state of all that is, which is what they call Satori. And that has nothing to do with God. I like this religion and anything that involves <laughs> sticks and whacking in order for you to focus better. I'm going to have to join a monastery. So, okay. So that's, so uh, digging into definitions of religion. So like, what is, what do you think is the scope that defines a religion? Oh, okay. So in um, my field, we have a, a, a few different definitions of religion, as you can imagine, just like philosophers have different definitions of what is real. Um, so I take this definition, and it comes from John Livingston, and it's um, religion is that set of beliefs and practices um, that determ that is inspired by a transformative, what is perceived actually to be a transformative and sacred power. Can you say that again? Yeah. <laughs> so religion is a set of, it's not just belief, it's also practices. It's both belief and practices because you won't have the practices without the belief. Yeah. So you have those together, okay? And it's inspired by what is perceived, because we don't know if it's real or not, what is perceived to be of sacred and transforming power. So perceived by the followers? Yeah. Or is this connected to the original sort of experience? No, no. It, well, it's, it's perceived by the followers. That's a really good definition. So- and that's the governing idea is that there's something of great power. Yes. Perceived to be of great power, which you can 
connect yourself either emotionally or intellectually somehow in order to explore the world that is beyond your own capabilities. Yes. And is there communication also involved? Or Generally. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great definition. Okay. So within that falls everything that we've, uh, we've talked about so far, including technology and um, alien life and so on. 